guess we've done I know we have a ton of things to do, so I really appreciate it. Um, so maybe just to start off and some context, uh, maybe just a bit of background on, on who Zach Rai George is. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, should I be looking there or looking at you? You can. Yeah. Either way? Yeah, I'm not sure of protocol when I, when I do these. It's um, yeah, so I um, came to South Africa in 2010, initially just on holiday to watch uh, the World Cup, as a lot of people did. Um, I didn't know anything about South Africa at the time. In fact, the, the perception of South Africa back then was quite negative, and a lot of tourists were advised to be very... Still is kind of... Yeah, uh, they were advised to, to be careful around where to go, from stadiums to hotels to tourist centers. And there wasn't much global coverage on South Africa from a positive perspective most of the 90s and 2000s. So the World Cup was a pretty transformative moment in South Africa history. Yes, yeah, so I came here on holiday. At the time, I was an investment banker working at Barclays in New York. I was formerly at Lehman Brothers. Um, and um, I was here on holiday. And after spending about four weeks here, I made this very rash, impulsive decision to to extend my stay, I had a fabulous time here traveling sort of between Joburg and Cape Town, just the wildlands and the, the sea, the ocean, the surf, the yeah. sand, all the usual stuff that people love about the sea. I didn't know about, much about South Africa's history at the time, but, I, but it was beautiful. It reminded me a lot of San Francisco um, and other similar coastal towns that are close to big cities in you know, the US or Europe or in Asia. The cost of living was very affordable, but I also realized that there was a big gap in the technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship space. It didn't exist, just call a space. Right? There was no tech, there was no entrepreneurship. Um, and I just figured, having come from <coughs> Silicon Valley for, I got my MBA at Stanford in 2004, having come from that world, I realized a lot of similarities between the, the ecosystem in Silicon Valley and the ecosystem in Cape Town. It had a lot of potential. It had a lot of the elements that Silicon Valley had 20 years ago, but it hadn't been worked upon. Okay. And I figured that I could, uh, if I could start the process of building an ecosystem alongside um, angel investors, universities and research centers, potentially working with some government players, working with accelerators and incubators that didn't exist at the time. You could then create enough of a of an incentive for all of these different stakeholders to start something. Yeah. Um, and that was the genesis of why I decided to stay and why I didn't just go back to New York at the time. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to see the rest of history, but it's um, but it's a it's a constant evolving yeah. journey. Yeah. So I basically help together with a lot of very interesting, smart folks. I built the initial workings of the venture capital and acceleration ecosystem, starting with Cape Town, then South Africa, and then obviously over the last few years, the whole continent. Yeah. Okay. So that was then the start. Of Africa or was that a different vehicle that then? No, out? yeah, so Launch Africa is very new. Launch Africa is just a bit over two years old. Okay. Um, I started um, the first corporate accelerator in Africa. It was called Barclays Step Africa in 2015. It was the, the result of a lot of um, technology startups, but mostly fintech startups looking to work with um, banks, with insurers, with asset managers, with relatively low levels or degrees of success. So if you may remember, you know, th these are the early days of companies like Peach Payments, Payfast, mm -hmm. Paygate. Uh, very low adoption rates. Very low adoption rates. E-commerce was still a nice to have. Yeah. Um, people weren't using wallets for payments. The concept of peer-to-peer -peer insurance was unheard. So it was South Africa in the sort of, even in 2010, 11, 12, 13, we didn't really 
was a bit decoupled from the rest of the, the tech world overseas. So if you look at India, China, Western Europe, and North America, you know, tech was the, the level of technological adoption for, yeah, pretty mature for B2B or B2C consumer internet plays was so much more advanced. And where South Africa really took off was only post 2015, 2016 is when you started. I mean, like, can you imagine? I mean, there was there was no version of take a lot here yeah. until about four or five years yeah. ago. I mean, for a so-called first world economy in Africa, that's yeah. shocking. Yeah, I even, I even tried my hand at an e-commerce platform uh, for small scale makers and uh, producers uh, launched in 2015. Uh, lasted about 18 months. It was self funded and ran out of runway. So I have a little bit of personal experience in that uh, yeah. people would use social media and, and um, go online for product research, but the purchasing decision just, the action just didn't happen online. Like, yeah, there are lots of reasons for that. A, it's, it's, it's either a question of trust, people don't trust paying online. They don't trust buying online, they don't trust catalogs, they don't trust delivery. So trust is one issue, but the other issue is just access. Um, the penetration of e-commerce on the African continent is predicated on the ability of data costs going down to a level where, I mean, if you look at the cost of data, for example, in two large emerging markets, so India, in India, the cost of data, when I, when I last checked, is around 10 to 11 US cents per gigabyte, mm -hmm. right? So that 10 US cents is roughly what? Two rand? One, yeah, 10 US, is that two rand? Yeah, around, yeah. Yeah, around two rand, yeah. right? Yeah, so two rand. Yeah. South yeah. Africa today, most data plans are 100 rand, 149 rand. I mean, I think now it's down to Really, fifty rand for, for a one gig. Data? For one gig. What 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 provider can you get for one one? It's Vodacom, I think. I think. I mean, I don't really buy one gig yeah, data. The last I heard, it, I mean, at least a year ago, it was one forty nine. Okay. But maybe it's down to one hundred. Even That's fifty. Yeah. Even fifty is twenty five times what it is in India, yeah. right? Um, so yeah. So if the cost of data is so high, why would people want to not just shop online but even transact? So I think what 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 sort of really uh, accelerated the growth of e-commerce in Africa and South Africa specifically was a most recently the pandemic forced forced people to they had no other option but to but to procure online. That's why you saw huge. Uh, I mean, uh, gosh, what's it called? Uh, One card, Zulzi, the shop, uh, Shoprite, and Pick and Pay delivery apps. It's food, it's transportation. I mean, I mean, for Christ's sake, even Uber only came to South Africa in 2014 or 15, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Amazon, I know Amazon grew their revenue by $10 billion in three months in the pandemic because of the uptake in the yeah. global uptake in the situation. Yeah, I mean, so the bottom line is, yeah, there's been a, a, an increased lot in the last two to four, four to five years yeah. in from 2015 onwards, yeah. right, is when things sort of really take off um, but it's really up from here um, so yeah I've been I've been working so so I set up startup bootcamp in, in Africa so startup bootcamp is the largest accelerator or one of the largest accelerators in the world outside of the US the the primary or the premier accelerator for technology startups globally is Y Combinator yeah. uh, but Y Combinator is although Y Combinator is international in its cohort, it's physically based in San Francisco. Although for the last one year, the cohorts are entirely virtual, but it's a US themed accelerator. Um, you probably know of some of the top alumni like Airbnb yeah. and Dropbox and Stripe and Reddit. Yeah, so, uh, so Startup Bootcamp was the, the European version of that started in Amsterdam and Copenhagen and is now all over Europe, all over Asia. And in 2016, my partner at the time, Philip and I, we co-founded the, the Africa okay. chapter of Startup Bootcamp. Okay. Ever since we launched Startup Bootcamp, there have now been, I think, another 
there's nine or ten global accelerators on the continent. Plug and play, Founders Factory Africa, obviously Techstars and Y Combinator have not cohorts based team, but they have a lot of African ventures that are part of their cohorts. And then there are lots of um, regional accelerators popping up, good ones. So Nilab in Kenya, um, CC Hub in Nigeria, Microfraction, there's Flat Six Labs in yeah. Tunisia and Egypt. So. Um, accelerators are now pretty pretty standard and, and, and a household name, but as little as five or six years ago, no one knew what an accelerator was. So, yeah, so we're proud to have launched the first corporate accelerator in Africa. Um, and we spent about four years traveling all over the continent, not just um, finding entrepreneurs, screening them and selecting them, but also helping them grow and scale through partnerships with large yeah. with large yeah. yeah, that, yeah. that was a starting. Yeah, no, that's that's really awesome. And, and from your perspective, or your understanding, what's the difference between an incubator and an accelerator? Is there a difference? There's a lot of differences, plenty, and people often confuse the two. Yeah. Um, Yeah, incubators are usually open-ended programs. Incubators can last anywhere from six months to a year. To other, I've seen incubators last as long as two years. Incubators are mostly for entrepreneurs that are at the idea stage. Mm -hmm. Pre-formation. Uh, yeah, pre-formation an idea. They've got some prototype that they can work with, but it's almost definitely pre-revenue. Mm -hmm. It's definitely pre-revenue. Could possibly also be pre-product, possibly. Um, incubators typically don't invest actual money, and there's no actual equity taken in the companies. Incubators are usually funded by corporate sponsors or NGOs or foundations or DFIs. DFIs the development of financial institutions. Um, incubators tend to be low touch, so they have. A workshop here, a mentorship session there. There's some sort of a odd, or at least not oddly, a loosely structured curriculum. Mm -hmm. But you know, incubators are meant for pre-seed, super early stage ventures mm -hmm. to get them to a point where they can take a product or an MVP and start to now commercialize it at an accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Accelerators, on the other hand. A, they have a time duration. Most accelerators are at the very most three months. I haven't seen an accelerator longer than three months. There's usually a cash investment that goes into it. It's as little as $20,000 to as high as $150,000. Uh, there is equity taken by the accelerator fund. Uh, it's usually a very intense program, which is a combination of lectures, workshops, um, uh, peer review sessions, pitching sessions, and there's ultimately a demo day where you present what you do to a group of investors. Um, yeah, the content is very curated. So it's just, you know, just think of it as a, as a, as a relay race. Yeah. And incubators are, are essential before someone gets into an exam. Not everyone needs to go to an incubator and accelerator, but accelerators have very strict entry criteria, selection criteria. There's equity involved, there's a, a predefined curriculum, um, and, you're, and you're geared towards a demo day where you now go and raise seed funding. Yeah, I actually was invited to sit in a couple of weeks ago now on Stunnenbosch and Rock Wilshire. They had a demo day and there were some really exciting uh, presentations there. Really cool. Okay, so going from accelerators, right, setting up um, this accelerator in Africa, one of the first really global accelerator in Africa, up to two years ago when you uh, formed uh, Launch, Africa. Launch Africa. Why did you decide, or how and why did you decide to position yourself as a VC? 
not just kind of, I mean, you, you kind of cut your, 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 you, you cut your teeth as a, as a accelerator guy. Why then make this shift to a, the VC position? Well, it's just a natural next step, right? So it's just like an example, like after you can crawl, you start walking and after you start walking, yeah. you run. Right? You can't keep crawling your entire life, right? So listen, I'm being, I'm, 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 I'm being a bit fastidious here. Yeah. I shouldn't have said that, but the point is, you know, I've been running accelerators for seven years, from 2015, no, seven, six years, till the end of, well, till sort of mid-2020. Um, it's, it's an area that I'm very familiar with. I enjoy the, the, the ups and downs of venture building with founders, and it's super founder friendly, because you're building product and services and tech and legals and marketing and IP and tax and customer surveys, it's, it's very hands-on and immersive, yeah. yeah. Which is incredible because you get very close to founders and this is all across the continent, so it's, it's very engaging. But, you know from day one that your work is only half-baked. A founder is not going to become the next Jumia or Twitter or Facebook or Alibaba if they remain in an accelerator forever. You have to leave the nest. Mm -hmm. It's an important nest to be in, but you have to graduate and move on. So part of my desire was to follow the top founders that we've helped through the accelerator phase and help them in their journey as they grow and scale. So, but to get a certain level of trust and respect and reputation, whatever you want to call it, you have to have cut your teeth in the space for five, six years, yeah. or even longer. Mm -hmm. Most venture capital funds in Africa, sadly, are run by folks in the private equity industry, in the corporate finance industry, in the investment banking industry, who are used to listed securities or much larger private equity type transactions, and they assume that they can take that experience and just transfer and translate it to the venture capital industry. Mm -hmm. they, they're sadly mistaken, you can't do that because it's like oil and water. Yeah. So having spent six to seven years in the accelerator space, I was able to raise a VC fund for the whole of Africa and I had absolutely no problem getting deals because the founders know that we've worked with them for the last five to six years and we're not some fund that happens to have money mm -hmm. to invest but nothing else yeah so it's credibility it's street cred for lack of a better word and it's smart money and it's smart money yeah. right so i've always said as a vc if you don't add anything more than just your money then you shouldn't be in this industry mm -hmm. you shouldn't in fact the best vcs in the world are run by either ex-entrepreneurs that have had multiple startups mm -hmm or run by folks that have been part of venture building studios or accelerators or incubators because you work very closely with founders and you know their challenges and problems. You're not a bean counter that's managing money. Yeah. There are people that do that really well, but they should stick to being asset managers and fund managers and investment managers. Venture capital is closer to acceleration and venture building than it is to private equity. Mm -hmm. In fact, when people put those two names together in a sentence, I think it's completely disrespectful. You couldn't be more different. Venture capital is a highly risk tolerating, um, very hard to understand industry that most, not just South Africans, most folks in emerging markets that don't understand venture capital. Because you can't look for things like profitability and free cash flows, income stability, um, yeah, just, just so many metrics uh, just make no sense in venture. That, that actually touches on, on the next that point of discussion that I wanted to raise is what your take is on the role of, of a VC in the startup ecosystem. And I want to go more specific on that say in Africa because um, with with the African market South African market African market the way it is can we take a VC model from Europe from the States and apply it to African startups 
what is the what are the nuances that you've learned that kind of you know what are the main changes that, that need to be accounted for um, or are those things not really necessary those adjustments yeah listen you you can take some of it but you can't take all of it um, it's very hard to scale businesses not just in Africa so I would say sub-saharan Africa Southeast Asia and um, Latin America have very similar demographics. I said Southeast Asia because India and China operate very differently. If you've got 1.3 and 1.4 billion people respectively in countries like India and China, and they are one, you know, constitutional one economy unit, you can scale businesses very quickly from a B2C perspective. But in, in Africa, in Latin America, and Southeast Asia, so Southeast Asia is mostly Philippines, Indonesia, that sort of region, um, Hong Kong, etc. You need to be able to um, acquire customers at a fraction of the cost that you would do uh, in other markets. Reason being, points I mentioned earlier, internet penetration is not as high, cost of data is not that low, not everyone has a smartphone. So all these stats are getting better with time. So as a result, there is hope that B2C models can work more efficiently, but the reality is as a, as a venture-backed business, if you're not able to lower your customer acquisition costs as quickly as possible, you will struggle. You constantly need capital for marketing. Mm -hmm. You constantly need capital for for growth. Mm -hmm. Notice I didn't talk about profitability mm -hmm. um, because in the sharing economy, the gig economy, whatever you want to call it, um, you'll never make money initially. And sometimes it will take you one, two, three, five, ten, ten years or even longer. It took Amazon twenty-four years to become profitable. Uber is still, Uber is still not profitable, yeah. and neither is Airbnb. Airbnb may be, may be profitable. I don't know about Airbnb, but almost every business that serves a, cu a customer need directly is not profitable. And venture capital investors understand that and are, and, and are really okay with that because the metrics that really matter in today's world are not. Um, price, profitability, or quality, it's more a function of, and I, I, I talk a lot about this, is about how do you impact people's lives from a convenience perspective, and how do you save them time? So if you look at it from a pretty metaphysical perspective, one of the most important commodities that we have is time. I'd actually rate time more than money. Right? Why is, for example, there's so much investment time, money, and energy going into the anti-aging industry because time is a, is a limited resource, right? Yeah. Anyone can make money, but you can't, you can't reverse time. I think that that's kind of touches on the core why the on-demand streaming platform is so, uh, they're so successful as well. They're so in demand for investment uh, and leasing because of, you know, people have control of their time. Whether you want to go and sit down, you use your time you want to kind of it's any it. anything that 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 allows users to take charge of their own time and manage their time better is going to make money anything yeah. i mean from spotify to netflix to amazon anything that makes your life more convenient and saves you time is going to can or almost break I call it not my own definition but it's the, the price versus quality curve mm -hmm. so at some point the example I often give is why is it that millions if not hundreds of millions of people all over the world have no problem paying 20 to 30 percent more for a meal on Uber Eats or on Mr. Delivery or on Globo or whatever that means. Knowing 
very well that you're paying 30% more. You shouldn't be paying 30% more. It's because it's convenient, right? We have become, human beings have become more, I wouldn't say lazy, but I mean, what would you say? It? Comfortable is probably a more yeah, PC yeah, word. Yeah, 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 yeah. more comfortable. Yeah. Um, but it's also because time is, even though we've had 24 hours in the day for the last millions of years, those hours are less, are, are more valuable today mm -hmm. and will become even more valuable going forward, right? So people will always look at ways to make their lives less cluttered mm -hmm. because expectations of people have also gone up. Mm -hmm. You know, if yeah. you say you work eight hours a day, it was quite normal from the 1920s to the 1990s. Yeah. People are now constantly plugged into the digital yeah. ecosystem. Um, so as a result, any any piece of technology that makes your lives more convenient is always, always going to be valued high. And anything that avoids you having to go to the bank, that avoids you having to go to the post office, that avoids you having to take public transportation, that avoids you having to go to a hospital, that avoids you having to go to school. Mm. Look at my chain of thought. Yeah. You're reducing your dependence on capex and assets heavy resources. Mm -hmm. Anything that does that is going to make you money. Yeah. Uh, people are owning less assets mm. because it. Uh, Access over ownership. No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, because I mean, the, the, the concept of, of, of ownership of assets has become. I mean, think, and it's not just a pandemic. I mean, owning an asset or an asset. Even though an asset, be it a building, be it a hospital, be it a school, be it machinery, be it furniture, be it anything, an asset has, has, has an associated liability attached to it. Because if you can't sweat an asset and create a recurring cash flow stream from it, an asset becomes a liability. Yeah. Everyone knows this. This is basic high school accounting that people don't understand. So yeah, everyone wants to go buy a property. Sure, go buy properties. What's your liquidity? What's your liquidity? How do you create value from that? You want to buy a big fucking machine? Go buy a machine and make cardboard boxes, make chairs. You know, want to buy a plane? Go buy a plane. Want to buy a boat? Go buy a boat. You want to buy whatever? Buy a printing machine. Any asset, if not, if you can't sweat an asset, it becomes a liability because you now have to dispose of the asset. Right? There's going to be a massive glut in commercial real estate going forward. All the banks, insurers, telcos, retailers, manufacturers, tech firms that have physical office space, it's literally a dead asset. It's sitting on your books. They can't generate rent from it. They will likely not generate rent from it for many years going forward. The pandemic was a nice excuse for them to say, oh, it's the pandemic, so we can't fill our offices. But the reality is, Physical assets, got car ownership. You know, think about. I mean, I'm almost forty, but you know, I've got teenage stepkids. I've got an eight-year-old daughter. No one wants to, and all their friends. No one owns cars. Mm. There are grown-ass men and women in their twenties that can't drive. Yeah. And their excuse is, I don't need to drive. I'm yeah. Right. Um, I don't want to go to school. Why? What? What? What use is a four-year college degree? If it doesn't provide me real skills to work, mm -hmm. I might as well get a degree, a three month course in data science or in digital photography or in whatever, mm -hmm. you know, um, through Get Smarter or iLearn or Coursera or Udemy. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain professions that, you know, are exempt from that. Like, for example, you know, you can't learn how to be a doctor in three months online. Yeah can't learn how to be a lawyer for three months engineering yeah, but that's a certain linear profession yeah but a lot of uh, um, fields of study like marketing mm -hmm. um, business commerce I think honestly MBAs will become almost redundant in about five mm -hmm. to seven years most people think they're really old they all already are yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah it's an interesting trend so you've got to really look at in 
investing as a VC, you have to really look at investing and understanding where the future is at. In VC, you don't make money investing in trends today. Mm -hmm. You make money investing in trends in three or four years and backing founders that are building that today. Yeah. That's how you make exponential yeah. returns. Yeah, you can't be in that, that sea of sameness. You, you, you can't like be in that curve. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. Exactly. So, uh, on that, I know I mentioned uh, non-tech startups, right? Because um, that's mostly the space where my business is in, and that's mostly the space that I'm looking to help entrepreneurs or founders in the non-tech space because I'm not a tech founder, and uh, I think you know everybody knows that it's really difficult to find uh, tech partners for any venture because why wouldn't they just kind of go with their own thing. Um, so I've kind of planted myself in a, in a thing of, you know, within the African continent specifically, there's so much uh, money to be made in, in non-tech industries still. Um, so for non-tech startups, how does a non-tech startup position itself as an attractive investment prospect for a VC or content? Um, that's tough. Yeah, it's very tough. I, I know, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, I think it's public knowledge anyway, you recently did a deal, I don't know the nature of the deal, but you did a deal with uh, Minimalist Chocolate. Yeah, it was, listen, it was a small angel investment. It's not out okay. of my fund. My, okay. fund. my fund, would our fund would never invest in Minimalist Chocolate. Yeah, um, even a non-tech startup requires a, to be tech enabled mm -hmm. in order to succeed. Yeah. Right? So yeah. when I say when I say tech, I mean you know, minimalist chocolate is an example of an organic chocolate company that uses very selective healthy ingredients. But the only reason anyone would invest in them from an equity perspective is, is the ability to scale to e-commerce stores all over the world. Mm -hmm. So that there needs to be a very strong um, uh, play from a customer acquisition standpoint, digital marketing, there needs to be a really slick e-commerce, social commerce angle to it. Mm -hmm. How do you spread virality? How do you get customer adoption? How do you figure out the right um, optimal path to reduce your delivery shipping costs. Yeah, um, if you're shipping overseas, how do you minimize storage costs? So there is a tech component to all of this. Yes. Like, if Minimalist Chocolate was just selling chocolates in Cape Town, no tech investor or no angel investor would even consider backing them ever. It's yeah. never gonna happen. So there is a tech enabled component to it. But again, I mean, just the, the honest thing, it's not about tech or not tech, it's about what is, your, what is your view towards how you're looking to scale. Most businesses in South Africa and Africa should not call themselves a startup. A startup, uh, most businesses in emerging markets are SMEs. They're small or medium enterprises, right? Because they're not bringing in new solutions to the market. Yeah, you're, you're, you're at, a, at a high level, you're producing a product or a service and you're selling it. Mm -hmm. And you're making a margin. That's what a small, that's what an SME is. Mm -hmm. There are millions, of, hundreds of millions of SMEs in Africa, hundreds of millions, right? SMEs have one goal, that's to become profitable and to create value for the founder. That's it. Nothing wrong with them, perfectly viable business model. But for someone selling cakes or pastries, to someone opening up a beauty salon, to someone making chairs, to someone selling computers, someone doing maintenance and repair, whatever, there's the hundreds of thousands of SMEs that exist all over Africa. SMEs have to be profitable, and most SMEs are either funded by the owner's capital, so bootstrap founders putting money in, or in certain cases, they get funding from working capital providers. But it's lending, it's debt in exchange for its funding an asset 
with an interest rate, and it's, it's working capital, it's capex financing, right? Taking money from external investors from equity is a recipe for disaster, unless you have um, exponential growth baked into what you do. So 99.9% .9 of businesses that think they are startups are actually not startups. So I, I would strongly encourage people to not call themselves a startup. Because a startup, the classic definition of, uh, of a startup is someone that, that has a scalable and repeatable business model that has the possibility and the potential for exponential growth. Right. By that definition, there are almost no startups in South Africa. Almost, I mean, I would say less than 1%. People are small businesses, yeah. but startups, very yeah. few. Yeah. I think we could, we could probably ex extend that to a conversation with my client earlier as well. The uh, entrepreneur, business owner labels. People, exactly. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, business, people are business owners. Entrepreneurs, you can't. You shouldn't call yourself an entrepreneur. It's just, it's cool to be called, a, uh, what do you know, oh, I run a startup. Really? Like, no, you're a small business, you make money for you, your family, whatever, your employees. Good, incredible. Don't say you're a startup because you're just going to go and bark up the wrong tree and try pitching to angels and VCs and you're gonna get 99% no's. It's a waste of your time. I get, on average, gosh, at least 100 pitches every month that I actually take a look at. And I have to say no to like literally 95% of them because you know, it just doesn't make any sense, That's right? That's a huge strike rate. For yeah, it's just, rate. yeah, yeah, and it's, it's actually worse sometimes because you shouldn't be pitching to VCs. VCs are the most risky capital to take. And I tell this to people like, pure accounting and econ 101 is, the cost of equity is the highest cost of capital. The moment I give you money and I own a piece of your business, you've lost that forever. Mm. You have lost that forever. I mean, like, for people to understand that basic concept yeah. is beyond me, why people don't struggle. So if someone says, okay, so Zach, I want to launch Africa to invest in us. Cool, yeah. we're gonna put money into your business. You can prove to me as much as you like what your business is worth. The reality is once you get a single dollar from us, we own a piece of you forever, mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. I have to keep reminding them, do you really want money from us? Mm -hmm. And then there people start thinking, actually, no, actually this, actually that. I think that's a, it's, it's a certain degree of self-awareness that's missing there from the founder side. Yeah. Uh, because like you mentioned, there's a thrill and a certain feeling of it's a cool thing to be an entrepreneur and to have a startup and to raise. Everybody wants to publish that they've had a successful raise, but is that for you or is that not for you? you know, yeah, as a founder. the market significantly overvalues people, which is why, I, mean, I don't know if people have noticed this, I haven't put out a single press release to the market mm -hmm. telling the market what Launch Africa has done. That up. And we are the biggest VC fund in Africa for oh. early stage companies. We've done 85 deals this year. That's really interesting. But we've had zero PR from us. Why? Other Why folks, I don't need, I don't, I don't need PR. That's cool. If people write about us, I can't tell them not write about yeah. us. We we are in the news constantly, but nothing is from us. And is that just is that a strategy, or is that just your no, personality just, that's coming through? It's my work. A lot of it is my personality. Yeah. I don't actively yeah. go out and seek validation. I yeah. just do shit. Yeah. Um, but the point is, raising capital is not an achievement. Mm -hmm. I need to tell founders this. Uh, raising capital does not, does not mean that your business is worth anything. It yeah. just means that someone, somewhere, or s s groups of people, were convinced enough about the opportunity yeah. To consider investing in you that's yeah. it yeah. it means nothing else some people love to write stories oh beach payments raised so much from North Africa Flex Club raised this from Control. this it's like yeah. 
so fucking what? It doesn't mean anything. You know, I, I have to say, I'm really glad that you're saying it coming from a VC because I hold that view, not, not to minimize that it's obviously a, puts you in an awesome position to scale and grow, but I don't view it as an exciting thing. I view it as a starting line. It's a starting line, yeah. So it's really cool because if, if, you, if it comes from somebody like myself who hasn't raised any rounds, and I, I don't really know if I would want to, uh, it can come across a bit bitter, you know? So I'm really glad that, that you, you said that. I mean, I would rather there be no press releases about this ever. I can't control it because people write, journalists love to write yeah. stories. They need to get paid from their sponsors and advertisers, so I respect that angle. Yeah. But the reality is, write a story, write stories about commercial traction. Mm -hmm. Hey, I am Better Bank. Uh, the founder was just downstairs here. We are a digital bank in South Africa. We signed a partnership with Access. We got a thousand new clients. We introduced a virtual wallet. We did this. Talk about commercial yeah. success. Who's the founder of Better Bank? Uh, Toby Manzar. Okay. okay. From a very small I'm back to four years ago. Four years ago, 2017. So, to, like, it should almost be an afterthought because, I mean, I mean, the, I mean this is a really a ridiculous analogy, but you know, it's really ridiculous. So don't even bother quoting it. But the analogy is, if you have a really fancy car, right? No one talks about the quality of engine oil and fuel in your car. They talk about how fast a car can drive. Yeah. You're like, oh, I have a, I have a Ferrari with like G20X F55, you know, engine oil to, to supercharge my engine. No, I have a Ferrari that can drive yeah. 100 miles per hour in five seconds. The same thing. Yeah. No one cares about who's backing you and how much money you've raised. They want to know what have you done with the money. Mm -hmm. So how fast you can drive, how fast you can, how, how quickly you can, how much, how, 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 how far you can travel. What's your, what's your performance, yeah. right? VC, so that's why I'm saying the glory should not be with the VC. The glory needs to be with the founder and, and his or her achievements. Mm -hmm. VCs are just messengers. That's mm -hmm. all they are. Mm -hmm. We're rocket fuel yeah. to help companies grow. Yeah. VCs will make a shitload of money when companies perform, mm -hmm. but it isn't about the VC. Yeah. That's why I say, like, don't make it about us. Yeah. It's a nice, sexy story to say, oh, I got money from Tiger Global, I got money from North Africa, I got money from. You know, and recent Harowitz, but like VCs are just enablers. That's it. Yeah. I like that. So, with that perspective of the VC isn't the guy in the arena, the founder is, what do you look for in a founder or a founding team? Because I'm sure you know you have the idea, but uh, everybody knows at this point that ideas are a dime a dozen. We uh, really up to the founder to execute. Uh, so, do you want to take a call or something? I don't mind, we can always... No, it's fine, it's fine. I've got my WhatsApp, so you should start blowing up at this time of the day. Okay. I'll, I'll reply to them later, it's fine. Okay, cool. Um, so, what do you look for in a founder or a founding team to really you know, get you excited about backing a certain venture? Now, listen, quite a few things. Um, this is a whole new conversation, but yeah, we look for... We look for really smart founders that are, um, I say this a lot, so if people have heard it before, excuse the, the repetition. Um, we look for, for founders that are, that know their market exceptionally well, that have a really good grasp of the industry, who are assertive, but not necessarily aggressive. There's nothing worse than an arrogant, egotistical founder or founders. Um, but at the same time, we don't want founders who are too meek and too timid and too coy and shy and can't, you know, um, lead. lead and be yeah. confident and have this air of um, just profound knowledge in an industry. Mm -hmm. And um, so you want to, you you want mentorable, coachable founders mm -hmm. that are assertive, but don't cross the line. Now, I have to understand that they came to you for a reason. Yeah, I mean, that you're, uh, as a VC fund, you really need to understand what value that you can bring outside of your capital. And that's typically access to digital talent. So you help founders with 
you know, I mean, listen, you're not there to, to replace a recruiter, mm -hmm. but you're there to, to provide them with leads or insights into where they can go for um, cross-border hiring, marketing, tech, yeah. legal, operational. You want to be able to help with, with, with access to the right human resources and talent for them. So talent acquisition is important. You want to be helping them with media, if it's print, online, whatever, media coverage, but also physical coverage at conferences, at summits, at pitching competitions, at, uh, at tech festivals, etc. You want to be helping them with access to other investors, follow-on funding. Mm -hmm. You want to be helping them with, uh, like I mentioned, PR, etc. Professional services. So there are lots of ways in which VCs can add value outside of just their their capital. Yeah. Um, and then as a VC, you want to back um, enterprises that have very large addressable markets, total addressable markets, mm -hmm. TAM for short. Yeah. So you know. Yeah. It's hard to give, to quantify it, but honestly, if you can't prove to me as a VC that you can address at least a billion dollar market mm -hmm. within five years, mm -hmm. that's the addressable market. Mm -hmm. It's, we're not gonna back you, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, we wanna see founders with skin in the game. Yeah. So founders paying themselves nice fat salaries and living in posh homes and driving fancy cars, mm -hmm. we just will not back mm -hmm. you, no matter how good you are. Right? Because don't come to us for money. Because remember, VCs aren't using their own money. Yeah, you're accountable to them. To others. Yes, yeah. I mean, I put a lot of my personal capital into my fund, but the majority of my fund is other people's money. Mm -hmm. That we have to, you know, deliver a return. Yeah. Often at least 25% annually. Oh. So there's a lot of risk adjusted returns that we are accountable for mm -hmm. as VCs. It's, being a VC fund manager is not. Um, it's a super, super stressful career. It's yeah. not dazzling or, or fun. It so is. much of it is outside of your control. Oh. Yeah, yeah. outside of your control. control. Yeah. yeah, but but you but you've got to engineer it yeah. as you've got to pick, which is why picking the right winner winners and after you've picked someone, helping them grow is just yeah. super important. Yeah. So. So backing entrepreneurs with large total addressable markets mm -hmm. is super is super important. And unit economics, you got to figure out, um, you know, how is your cost of acquiring customers decreasing over a period of time, mm -hmm. and how is the lifetime value of a customer increasing yeah. Yeah. with every successive week, month, year, etc. Um, you've got to back founders that have really good tech and IP, mm -hmm. so, there's, so it's defensible in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, all you need is um, uh, to understand market timing. Often, uh, more often than not, you've got a good product, but are just too early in yeah. the market. And someone coming right after you with slightly better UX and UI could, could take a share. So the timing aspect is very hard because it sits out of an intangible, mm -hmm. but um, something that uh, VCs pay a lot of attention to. So, yeah, they're quite a few. But I would say as an early stage investor, pre-Series A, we focus a lot on unit economics and uh, founders that really understand their market. It's You'd be amazed at how many founders know so little about their market compared to the VC, because the VCs see a lot of pitches from yeah. lots of folks in a given market. As VCs, we often know more about competitors and themselves, which is a bit annoying. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, that's, that's, I think that's all the time that I'm gonna take, that's really a, a depth of, of insights there, really awesome. Thank no, so cool. much. I mean, yeah. hopefully you've got a